The U.S. Navy's Aegis Cruiser is the most lethal surface combatant at sea today. This Ticonderoga-class vessel is a versatile warship. Thanks to its sophisticated electronics, its advanced weapons, and the well-trained men and women who serve on it. Until late in the 20th century, naval warfare meant firing at enemy ships and land targets with large caliber guns. The topside area of the traditional battleship served to display a nation's military strength. An impressive sight, but one that became less and less useful with advances in electronic warfare and long-range weapons, such as cruise missiles. U.S. naval expansion during the Cold War led to significant enhancements in fleet protection and engaging the enemy. The paramount threat to U.S. forces was the Soviet Union's wide-range missile capabilities. U.S. ship designers employ the latest advances in microelectronics, computers, and missile and radar capability. The outcome was a radically new concept in naval warfare the Ticonderoga-class Aegis Cruiser. It appears to be devoid of weapons, a warship without firepower. Despite its appearance and relatively small crew, it is a class of ship that is both versatile and deadly. Recently deployed to the Arabian Gulf in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, the USS Lake Champlain is one of 24 Ticonderoga-class cruisers in the U.S. Navy's fleet. Lake Champlain is 567 feet long. It's got a width of 55 feet, and it displaces about 9,600 tons. Crew complement is about 360 crew members with a normal officer complement of about 23. We have the capability of bringing on two helicopters, and if we do, that'll add about four or five officers and about 10 or 15 crew members. So total complement, when we're fully loaded for deployment, uh, can reach almost 400. The four 80,000 horsepower gas turbine engines on board the cruiser are the same as those used in the DC-10 aircraft and permit the 10,000 ton vessel to achieve speeds in excess of 30 knots. The twin engine twin propeller system is computer controlled from either the engineering section or the bridge. Stay on course 208, checking course 195. Very well. Named for the shield carried by the Greek god Zeus, Aegis is a powerful and complex weapon system found within all Ticonderoga-class cruisers. 
the Navy began the Aegis program long before this particular class ship was, was thought of. Uh, Aegis is basically an evolution through the steps of improving the AAW or anti-air warfare capability of the Navy. That's where it really started. This particular class ship, the Ticonderoga class, was first contracted in 1978 with CG-47. She was actually commissioned in 1983. The platform itself is only part of what Aegis is all about. Aegis is a combination of many systems controlled through computerization. Aegis is the spy radar, Aegis is the command and decision, Aegis is the weapons control system. Aegis is the conglomeration or the bringing together of all of the combat systems in this platform. Uh, it's the best and most up-to-date system that the Navy has. Prior to Aegis, traditional rotating radar systems were directed away from their targets over half the time. A dangerous gap in any air defense strategy. Aegis has a superior kind of radar system, the SPY-1. Hull-mounted panels or arrays give the cruiser 360-degree coverage at all times, a far more dynamic and comprehensive survey of potential threats. The range of the SPY-1A radar is approximately 250 plus nautical miles and is able to track 256 objects simultaneously. SPY-1 Alpha is a phased array, electronically steered radar, which consists of four SPY arrays or array faces. These four arrays give us 360 degree coverage at all times. SPY-1 Alpha is uh, controlled by a four-bay uh, computer suite, which basically forms, steers, and uh, actually schedules these radar beams, which we call dwells, at its own interval. The range of the SPY-1 Alpha radar is approximately uh, 250 plus nautical miles, with maxing out uh, probably about 260 nautical miles. Using a command and control layout, or C2, Aegis is able to deal with an enormous amount of data arriving from multiple sources. The Tactical Action Officer, or TAO, filters this information and displays an electronic picture of the surface, air, and undersea combat zones so that the ship's commanding officer can make critical decisions on battle group protection and engaging the enemy. Aegis cruisers are, above all, weapons platforms, applied either as an integral part of a battle group or as an independent operator. One of their primary missions is anti-air warfare and providing the coordination and the command and control in a carrier battle group is what Aegis really does the best. We have other primary mission areas uh, in ASW, anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, strike warfare, but the anti-air warfare mission is one of our big strong points. The SM-2 standard missile is the cruiser's first line of defense. In early models of the Aegis cruiser, they were launched from twin arms. Now missiles are fired from vertical launch systems hidden beneath the main deck. Capable of intercepting targets up to 60 miles away, the missiles are guided by the SPY-1. SM-2 is primarily surface to air. It gets its data from the SPY-1 Alpha radar that we have on board, and it's a real-time system. The SPY will provide continuous information to the missile, as first of all, before it launches, and then during its flight. 
Uh, we have illuminators during the terminal phase or the last few seconds of flight of the missile that will shine on the target and then provide final close-in data for the missile so that its probability of kill will be increased. If enemy missiles evade the SM-2s, there is the SeaWiz, or close-in weapon system. One of the most powerful and accurate rapid-fire guns in the U.S. military arsenal, the SeaWiz rate of fire is 50 rounds per second. Located on both port and starboard sides, the SeaWiz uses tungsten shells that can easily pierce the lightweight missile casing. Anti-ship warfare, Aegis cruisers are equipped with eight harpoon missiles fired from the stern. Working in concert with other ships and aircraft in the battle group, the crew can fire upon an enemy without actually seeing its target. the Harpoon missile is we'll use either other ships' radars, our own, as well as helicopters' radars to get a good fix on where the enemy might be. Then we'll build up a good fire control solution, work up a, a probable position where it's going to be, and then plan our, our missile shot, hopefully to either surprise it, uh, to avoid land or, or friendly ships, and then to uh, engage the contact. Harpoons fly along the water and are able to avoid other ships and land obstacles en route to the target ship. As it closes in on its target, an onboard radar is activated and directs the missile to its impact point. Against long distance seaborne targets, the cruiser uses the Tomahawk anti ship missile, or TASM. As with the Harpoon, TASM missiles are programmed to evade land and sea obstructions. An active radar is used to direct the 1,000-pound warhead to a range of 250 nautical miles. Tomahawk works off a satellite. For that reason, it's a non-real-time system. With the positional fix that we'll get on the enemy, we'll get an associated time, and the system will build a solution of future where it will be based on past positions. The T-LAM looks exactly like the TASM and is fired from the same vertical launchers. Using terrain comparison radar for navigation, this Tomahawk variant is designed to attack land targets often at the request of ground forces. Its onboard computer compares a digital picture of the target with a live image feed from its camera for real-time precision targeting. This targeting system is called DSMAC for Digital Scene Matching Area Correlation. The T-LAM can travel 700 miles to deliver its 1,000-pound payload. The missile can either airburst to destroy exposed targets or dispatch cluster munitions. Aboard the cruiser, the most visible weapons are the two 5-inch guns at the front and rear of the main deck. They are operated by a crew of six below deck. The small crew can reload the gun while firing on targets up to 13 miles away. The silent, unseen threat of enemy submarines remains a vital concern of naval operations. The Aegis can protect the battle group with ANSQS-53 hull-mounted sonar, the Tactus towed array sonar, and the LAMPS helicopter. 
The ANSQS-53 is a high-power, long-range system and the first in the Navy to be digitally linked directly to onboard computers. Tactus uses hydrophones attached to a mile-long cable towed from the stern. This sonar system has a very broad detection capability, even against the quieter nuclear-powered submarines. Aegis cruisers extend the range of their submarine detection capability by using LAMP's Mark III Seahawk helicopters. These aircraft enhance a battle group's sub-locating capability, not only by avoiding ship noise such as engines and wakes, but by flying far out and deploying sono buoys. Sono buoys are small floating sonar devices that transmit data back to the fleet by way of the LAMP's electronic detection system. They also use a magnetic anomaly detector, which can sense minute changes in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the presence of submarines. To further expand their ASW capabilities, the Seahawks are equipped with the acoustically guided Mark 46 light torpedo. Seahawks are rugged and durable, but flying the 10-ton aircraft from the small deck of the Aegis requires special skill on the part of both the aircrew and the ship. In poor weather, flight operations are a test of the equipment and the courage of the men and women involved. To make a landing in heavy seas, Aegis cruisers use a special winch to actually pull the helicopters aboard. To the outsider, the Aegis cruiser is a computerized weapons platform using the latest advances in technology. To those who serve on it, the ship is both home and office, where the captain and crew must live as well as work. To the crew, it's a drastically different way of life from the one they left behind. Work. Recreation, meals and ceremonies, piloting through hazardous waters, preparing for combat over and over again until it becomes second nature. One such routine is general quarters, where the crew runs a gauntlet of drills to test and improve their readiness for a variety of shipboard emergencies, fires, flooding, as well as chemical, biological and radiological attack. In an actual situation, through fires or combat, our job is to maintain the ship's stability so it can perform its, its functions or its project, whatever it has to do to get through. Uh, if we have to do uh, major casualties, uh, firefighting, uh, flooding, uh, shoring type techniques, anything of that nature. To test the crew in damage control, a smoke generator simulates the effects of a fire and a strobe light its source. In no time, the ship's machine shop is filled with smoke and instructors take up their positions. It's announced that there's a fire in the engine room or the machine shop and general quarters begins. We manned repair locker three, which is in the aft part of the ship closest to this, to this space. Uh, the team members uh, grab OBAs, like I said, they may be scattered throughout the ship or something like this, well, since this was called, go to the locker, get their equipment, you've got uh, hosemen stuff flanking the hoses out, you have boundary men going out, checking surrounding spaces, evacuating closed spaces, uh, basically everybody's trying to get set up. Uh, you have a, a team leader, a nifty operator which uh, is a thermal imager, help you see in the smoke, uh, field area to locate the fire, to, to lead the fire team members, the two host team members, into the space and show them exactly where the fire is at and, and fight the fire. Two host teams will enter with the team leader. The team leader will point it, direct them to the fire, point it out, um, and they will go and put the fire out.
Aegis duty also consists of manning equipment, mail call, flashing lights, and bridge watch. Well, being on board and being as a crew member, it's uh, doing your job day in and day out. Uh, sometimes it's kind of tedious, and, you know, doing it in uh, repetition or so. But also, it's kind of fun, you know, being one of the guys and you get to know everybody. And, uh, of course, there's times when you miss your family and you think back. And, uh, sometimes you're out and uh, you're not getting mail as you wish you were getting. Your morale drops a bit. And if you uh, kind of believe in what you're doing and just hope and will believe that you're out here for a reason, then you just <laughs> keep counting the days until you get back in. Commanding an Aegis cruiser requires a person with experience, patience, wisdom, and a sense of priorities. If one were to ask me what it felt like to uh, command an Aegis cruiser that some people have called the uh, most lethal weapon system that the Navy has today on the surface, uh, I would say that it's really not uh, the fact that it's a lethal weapon system. I would say more that it is the fact that you are given the opportunity to command people, uh, and that's what the Navy is all about. It's the opportunity to try a leadership style and get people to do what you want them to do. Uh, it's not the fact that uh, we can fire missiles out of our vertical launching systems or put uh, torpedoes in the water or launch helicopters off of our helo deck. It's the people that you work with, it's the, the talent that you see on the ships, the, the enthusiasm that people display. That's what really uh, command is all about. The Navy is platforms, but more than platforms, it's the people that you get to work with and hopefully lead them the way they ought to be led. Often called the shield of the fleet, the U.S. Navy's Aegis Cruiser is the world's most formidable surface warship. With its advanced electronic monitoring systems, sophisticated weapons platform and well-trained crew, the Aegis Cruiser is able to protect the battle group and unleash tremendous firepower against land, sea, and airborne threats.